I know I've been talking about this a lot with circulation. Remember that respiration is not just, but it is getting oxygen from our lungs into our blood and then from our blood the oxygen into our cells to help us with cellular respiration. So there's the breathing part of respiration and then the cellular part of respiration. So we have those two parts there. I know oftentimes with these systems, we often think of like the, the big part of the system, but all of it funnels down to these like little microscopic portions. Cellular respiration inside of all of your cells mostly occurs in the mitochondria. Remember the mitochondria look like this. They're the little powerhouses of the cells that undergo cellular respiration. So with a supply of oxygen, we more efficiently break down our energy sources. We get more ATP per our food. As a waste product of that, carbon dioxide is released. So cellular respiration. We need a continual supply of energy for four things, for growth, repair, maintenance, and development. You all are pretty much done with development, pretty much done with growth. You're in the repair and maintenance phase of your lives. Yeah, being an adult sucks for so many reasons. So what we need is we need things that I know like when we we're talking about cellular respiration, the placeholder is like glucose, excuse me, glucose C6H12O6 plus oxygen, make ATP, carbon dioxide, and water. But really glucose, this can be any kind of nutrients or energy because eventually everything goes through metabolic pathways and makes its way into cellular respiration at some point. ATP is the currency of our cells, our carbohydrates, proteins, fats. They are all too big to fit into our cells. And so they need to be broken down. And this is what we would call like the currency or the money really of our cells is that this is the most usable form of energy in our cells. So how do we get the oxygen in? We breathe. Right? Breathing extracts oxygen into our lungs. Our lungs extract oxygen from the air. Oxygen is brought within diffusing distance of our circulatory system. Our circulatory system brings from our cells, from our body, carbon dioxide back to the lungs. So we extract oxygen from the air and we release carbon dioxide back out. All right, so respiration occurs because of, and most things in our body are ruled by this principle of diffusion that atoms and molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. And there are some cases where we have to like go in the opposite directions and then that uses energy. But if we're moving in terms of just diffusion, high concentration or low concentration, there's no cost of energy to our body or our cells. So like this, if you have a high concentration of oxygen in your blood and you have a low concentration in your cell, because you've used up most of the oxygen for cellular respiration. So as the cell is working, the amount of oxygen is going down. So oxygen in our blood will diffuse from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the cells. Um, does this have to do with osmosis? Osmosis is the movement of water. Oh. Yes, so osmosis is a form of diffusion specific to water. Okay. Good, it's good. So gas exchange, gas exchange in organisms is based on diffusion. Oxygen is consistently being depleted or used in cellular respiration. 
to break down our food and nutrient sources. Carbon dioxide, as a result, builds up. So they kind of do this balance thing, that as oxygen is brought into the cells and gets used, we get carbon dioxide build up. When carbon dioxide is high, because all the oxygen gets used up in cellular respiration, carbon dioxide diffuses from high concentration in our cells to low concentration in our blood. So like, oh, I'm getting there. So this is a very important concept in our body because of the principles of diffusion. Just when we have these small atoms or molecules or compounds and they can move from high to low concentration, we don't spend a lot of energy on that. It's kind of like a big bonus in our body. So think about it like this, that if this is a blood vessel that's bringing blood out to the body. So if we're talking about like arterioles or arteries that are going away from the heart and then they're getting smaller and smaller and eventually branching to capillaries that are bringing a high concentration of oxygen to the cells, Cells are constantly using oxygen for cellular respiration. So oxygen will diffuse from high concentration at low concentration. As oxygen gets used up, the product is carbon dioxide. Often think about it as like waste. And then that diffuses from high concentration to low concentration in a capillary that eventually goes to a vein, a venule, and then a vein. Because the, remember, veins go to the heart. All respiratory surfaces have three features in common. So one is that they have to be moist. Water is needed to facilitate the diffusion of these very small atoms, molecules, compounds. The tissues have to be really thin because we're talking about really small atoms and molecules and compounds. And there has to be a large surface area. So you gotta have a lot of space because cellular respiration is really, really important. So you have to have a large surface area to keep this process going. So regardless of what organism we're talking about, they're going to have this in common with their respiratory either structures or organs. So we're going to see a little bit about some different organisms and how they have evolved to undergo respiration. So let's start here with some simple animals. So we're talking about like a flatworm, a jellyfish, or a sponge. They do not have a respiratory system. We have a whole system. They have just structures. So they're a lot more simple, but they've been around for longer than we have. So they have evolved the ability to respire without having a respiratory system, only structures. They also, there's features about their bodies that allow for a very large surface area for respiration to occur. So the first one we're gonna start with are flatworms. These are worms, like not like an earthworm, like round and chubby, but they are flat, more like a piece of paper. You can also see that it's kind of curly. So not only is it flat, but if you take a piece of paper and you crumple it up, you're going to have a lot more surface area. If you have, let's say that if we're looking at a flatworm and it's like this, if it is curled up, maybe it can actually be like two, Right? If we're looking at like something that is the same size, which one has more surface area, this or the two of these? Isn't this two pieces of paper now? But all of these folds then allow for more surface area. So you can have a smaller organism that has more surface area than something that's bigger. So those folds in this organism are very important. It allows for increased surface area. So the flatness 
allows for every cell in their body to be close to the surface where oxygen can diffuse right from water into every cell and carbon dioxide out. So having this flatness, they can just respire right on the outside and on the other side, the back side of the organism. They live in water, so their environment is already moist. They have a large surface area and every cell is in contact with the environment. Jellyfish. So jellyfish are quite interesting in that they have a really thick part and then they have these skinny tentacles. One of the things that they have evolved is that they have evolved for cells to have different needs for oxygen. So that ones that are deep inside of the bell or this chubby part, they don't have the ones that are inside, inside, inside do not have as high of a need for oxygen as the ones that are closer to the surface on the outside. And then sponges, which are the simplest animal, they have a lot of holes in them. So it's kind of like a piece of paper like this already, right? You've got this, we could stretch it out. We could see that it's quite big, but it's more dense. And then if we put holes in here, that would increase the amount of surface area or every cell to be in contact with water that flushes through. So we have a lot of good strategies here with these very simple organisms. Again, no respiratory, surf I mean, no, no respiratory system necessary. So let's talk about organisms that have a respiratory system. Those are in close contact with the circulatory system. Inside of our lungs, we have alveoli sacs that are covered in little tiny blood vessels. But let's start with fish. Okay, so fish swim in water they have a gill system for respiration. So they breathe underwater. Look at all the layers of the gills, plus look at all the folds. So lots of folding means you're gonna increase your surface area as well as all of the slices or layers. Depending on the metabolic needs of the fish, as well as if, let's say a fish lives like really deep somewhere and there's just not a lot of oxygen, they might have really big gills. So they might have a really big head for all their gills to be in. If there is a lot of oxygen availability, the gills are like a moderate size. So why, let's take a look at the gills. Why, when you look at gills, are they red? What are they gonna be packed with? So does that mean that they're injured and bleeding? Nah, I mean, maybe, but nah. They turn red in the presence of carbon dioxide? That seems weird. They're closely associated with blood? Yes. Okay, they're more closely associated with lungs. Do they have lungs? No, they have gills. So C is gonna be correct. So that's why they're red, is because they're packed with little capillaries so that they are associated closely with the lungs. I mean, the, the blood, the blood. Sorry, blood, not lungs. Okay, so capillaries, packed with those little tiny blood vessels. And remember, th this, you know, we're showing one out of water, but they would be in water. I'm gonna guess this is dead fish out of water. That would hurt, right? They also have flaps that cover their gills, and you often will see the flaps moving like this on a fish. Fish also will swim around like this because they get water and it flushes inside their mouth and across their lungs and it goes out the back end. Um, also, fish can just sit still and do this. 
and they're pumping water across their lungs without swimming. So they can swim with their mouths open or they can pump it across. Is that involuntary for them? That's a good question. I, uh, I don't know. Probably. I would Probably. assume, right? Because like you can think about it like when they're when they're sleeping, it's not like they're thinking about right. opening their mouth. True, true. Yeah. yeah. In air, the gills will collapse. So that's why you don't want to keep fish out of water because they need a moist respiratory system. So they need to be in water for the respiratory surfaces to work. All right, if you live on land, let's talk about like bugs, cockroaches, for example. Insects use what's called the tracheal system, tracheal system. That means they have more than one trachea and vertebrates use lungs with also trachea as well. So we're gonna take a look at uh, bugs. Bugs have branching tubes, tubes called trachea. So they have more than one. Their trachea are on the sides of their bodies. They do not have a trachea at their mouth like we do. Sides of their bodies. Yeah, they're pretty, they're kind of wild. Um, the trachea on the sides of their body have little holes, but they can close them up. And those are called the, the ability to close them. They're, uh, they have spiracles. So like if they're, you know, going deep down into dirt, they don't want to have their trachea collecting dirt inside of their breathing system so they can close that off. In some species of caterpillars, you could actually see like pigments that, like markings yeah. around where all the spiracles are. You can see. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Eventually what happens to the trachea, they branch smaller to smaller tubes called tracheoles. And those tracheoles will branch so small that they come in contact with every cell in the body. So if you wanted to suffocate a cockroach, you wouldn't cover their face. You'd hold them on the sides of their body. But don't do that. That's cruel. Cockroach is trying to, trying to live, do its cockroach thing. So here, you can see an insect and the tracheoles on the side of the body, sorry, trachea on the side of the body. Spiracles will cover those. And then they branch smaller and smaller and smaller to every part of the body. You can see that the head and the antenna are serviced by trachea and tracheoles in the front part of the body, not in the mouth. And that's how cockroaches can hiss and caterpillars can squeak. There's, yeah, there's a species of caterpillar that its defense against predators is it'll like, it, it'll actually like squeeze it really fast or it's here, it'll make a, it'll make a squeaking sound. <laughs> it'll, sound it'll sound like a squeaky toy, I'm not kidding. Oh my god, that makes sense, like, right? Yeah, there's, I, I find that like, they're pushing video, air uh, out. There's like a viral video on, on YouTube of like this huge cal caterpillar and somebody's like giving it like a little soft pinch and it'll go, it'll squeak. It's so cute. <laughs> not cute that they're pinching it, but... Uh, when we're talking about vertebrates, vertebrates have lungs, but let's think about this. An evolution. That frogs have very simple lungs, but in their developmental stages, they swim like a fish and they have gills. So they transition their respiratory systems from a water system to an air system as they develop early on. So there again, we see that connection from vertebrates to water. Remember that uh, amphibians also use skin to help them breathe because their lungs are not as developed as ours are. Birds and reptiles have more advanced lungs. Birds are fascinating in terms of their respiratory system. A couple of reasons why is that birds live high up in the air. As you go higher up, oxygen decreases. So they have less availability as they, they fly higher. Also, imagine if you had to fly 100 miles, 30 miles. You're this little bird and you gotta fly, fly, fly. Do you not need more oxygen to get more of your 
energy source is broken down through cellular respiration. So they need a higher intake of oxygen. So in addition to their lungs, they have air sacs around their lungs as well. What that's gonna do, it's gonna give them that extra boost of oxygen. It's gonna increase or make a maximum absorption of oxygen as much as possible. So let's check out the real estate. The respiratory system takes up the majority of the body of the bird. Not only do they have air sacs, they also within the lungs, they have what are called parabronchi. Inside of the lungs, they also have holes. It looks like a sponge, doesn't it? More holes means more surface area, which means that you can absorb more oxygen. So they've got three big strategies for absorbing oxygen. They use those, that, those extra air sacs to help puff themselves up when they're, when they're trying to ward off predators? No, the, the, the thing that birds do to like, where, where they like look extra fluffy, that's just them raising their feathers. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they just do that, they mostly do, that's not like, a, a really a defense to like it, it can be like an intimidation it's cooling too but right? like it's it's that, that's just them like warming themselves yeah up and themselves up. Oh, yeah i meant that's what i meant like yeah. warming it can yeah. get more air inside of their fluff and then the body temperature can heat up the air and make for a warmer like yeah, it looks adorable. almost like a, a sleeping bag it makes it look like a pom-pom it's cute when they do that yeah it's cute and with the with the bird's respiratory system um I know like a bird bander who like works forest preserves. Her name is Leslie. She's like licensed bird bander. Um, I've known her for years. She actually she gave like I feel like this is like the perfect explanation for how a, how a bird breathes. She she said if you were a bird you would have to if you wanted to blow out a candle you would have to breathe in to also breathe out. Like yeah yeah you gotta um, get the air in too because birds inhale exhale at the same time. It's like you can't you can't like inhale and then exhale like it it's one continuous cycle so it, 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 if you wanted to exhale you'd have to inhale as well right good thanks yeah. thanks for that and then humans we have lungs and we know that our lungs take up a lot of real estate or the majority of the real estate in the top part of our body and then there's room for the heart as well but look at how big the lungs are so air conduction Air goes from the mouth and nose to the back of the mouth, the pharynx, past the vocal cords, the larynx, down the trachea, branches into two branches that go one to each lung, the bronchi, the bronchi branch smaller into bronchioles. And then at the ends, you have tons and tons and tons of alveoli, which are tiny little air sacs. So in, this is the flow into the lungs. In birds, the larynx is actually called the syrinx. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and, yeah, and, it, and, it, and it actually, it's, yeah, like, because it is like the voice box, it helps with them singing. So oh. that's how birds can sing. Which would make sense, like singing, syrinx, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is what our respiratory system looks like. Again, you can see a lot of real estate taken up. Air goes in through the mouth and nose, past the back of the mouth, the pharynx, past the voice box, the larynx, down the trachea branches to each lung by bronchi, smaller branches, bronchioles, and then at the ends of the bronchioles, you've got thousands, millions, I should say, of alveoli. So you can see all these little air sacs there. The other thing to notice is that there are capillaries all around branches of capillaries all around the alveoli to make for a maximum diffusion of oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. 